Please don't think the market is like a, a Robin Hood type character who's going to peel money off, off the trees and, and hand it to you, right? No. The market is a big, ugly beast. So today I'm sitting down with Brent Penfold. I spoke with Brent a few years ago, actually, 2017. We had the first interview together. Brent wrote a book that I really liked that really made a big difference in my training before. And so I want to discuss again, kind of do a follow-up interview on that. So how's it going, Brent, today? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Yeah, I'm well. Perfect. You're based in Sydney, Australia. So I'm in Bangkok, like we said before. So I want to hear what happened since we last spoke in 2017. Well, not much. <laughs> yeah, people ask me what I do and not, nothing's changed for the last 20 years. I just, you know, get my data run my models, update my positions, uh, I get my newsletters out, I um, help my students, and um, I'm usually finished by about you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, Sydney time. I'm really fortunate because you know, the sun rises or the day starts. Technically, I suppose New Zealand is the first you know, country that wakes, wakes up. But Sydney, we're, we're the second country that you know, opens up. And we open up after North America has closed. And so I sit in a really good you know, time zone. But, um, you know, when I wake up, basically, uh, North America is closed. So, you know, it, I can collect all my data and put all my orders in basically before Asia opens. Um, and that, I do that for the next 24 hours. Yes, yeah, so I'm basically finished by just after 9 a.m. Sydney time most days. And... Um, you know, I read a lot during the day. Um, if I feel enthusiastic, you know, I'll, I'll do, you know, I'll have an idea in my mind and I'll, I'll research. Yeah, my, my kids are still young, so I'm still involved in running their, their sporting teams and managing their sporting teams and I'm quite flexible in my time. Things are pretty good, you know. I'd probably prefer to be um, less heavier or less heavy than I am, but that's just how life is. And uh, I suppose the big thing is I, um, I finally finished... My, my follow-up book, Universal Principles of Successful Trading. And what's interesting is that when I wrote the Universal Principles, I probably finished that in three months. I just, just you know, you just, you just do it. And this one, I, I looked at my, my, um, my first couple of, you know, half chapters I, I'd, I'd written. And I looked at the, um, you know, when you save a file, there's always like a date. And, you know, I started writing this book probably three years ago. And I've only just just finished it. I don't know. Maybe as you get a bit older, you have less enthusiasm, and um, I don't know. Well, maybe it wasn't a high priority. But the good thing is that I um, I gave a real really hard push probably just before Christmas uh, to finish it off. And now it's with John Wiley, and we're we're going through the uh, editing process. So I suppose in terms of a big um, a big change for me in terms of what the public knows me for is that, um, yeah, I've finally finished the follow-up book to the Universal Principles. So the first book was really huge for me, where I learned a lot of things that I didn't, I didn't even know existed about trading. So what is the second book going to bring that's going to be different than that? How is it going to help people even more? Well, I think it's, um, I see the second book, or well, the, the, the first book was called The Universal Principles of Successful Trading. And I took a very holistic approach to say what's primary for you and I to make money is first we have to survive. If we can survive, then by default our account balance is building. So I took a really holistic approach. And we talked about you know, the most important thing about you know, survival is following a good process of trading. And I didn't spend much time at all. I really didn't discuss any of the really interesting stuff of trading, which is strategies. You know, I didn't really talk about entry techniques. I didn't talk about setups. I didn't talk about stops. Um, I, I took a much, a much higher level uh, approach to it, if that makes sense. Over the years, I've had a lot of you know, questions saying, oh, Brent, uh, can you give me an example of what an objective tool is? Because one, one of my key messages from the universal principles is that in my opinion, it's very hard to succeed when we use subjective tools, tools that have variables in them that allow you and I to have too much influence on their value and, and therefore their, their interpretation. 
And so people kept asking me, okay, we understand that, Brent. We understand it's, it's, it's better to have fewer indicators than more indicators. And, you know, we understand it's better to have fewer variables than more variables. Give us an example. And, and I, I understood that. So what this next book is, it's called The Universal Tactics of Successful Trend Trading. And so the second book is a more practical how-to guide. So I actually see this, this um, second book as being like a missing chapter. So we have the first book, which is the universal principles. And we're talking high level principles. So it doesn't matter what markets you trade. It doesn't matter what time frame you trade. It doesn't matter what instruments you trade. And it doesn't matter what techniques you trade. There are some irrefutable laws you have to follow. You have to follow to basically survive and then succeed in the markets. But I never gave any concrete examples of strategies or strategy developments. So the new book, it's, 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 all, it's all about techniques. It's about entries, stops, setups. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a practical how-to guide, if that makes sense. So first book, very holistic talking about the importance of following a good process of trading. And the second book is basically, well, this is an example of what I was talking about from the first book. So I see it as being like a, a missing chapter, if that makes sense. I like that. So have you always been that hands off when, of your trading? Like you finish by 9 a.m.? Has it always been that way? Or did you kind of try the other side of that before where you are really involved in the market, trying different things and all the time did you try both sides when, when i um when i started trading when i was at bank of america i had a fantastic treasurer um at bank of america in sydney and he, he was a fantastic guy and he introduced me to uh Eddie wave theory and back in 1983 um trading was a very intuitive instinctive um thing to do and um uh, Elliot Wave was an approach that, that, that uh, my treasurer was interested in and, and he introduced that to me. And as you know, um, Elliot Wave is a, a discretionary approach. It, it relies on the trader's interpretation of the rules. And when you're a discretionary trader, when I was a discretionary trader in the beginning, I'd, I'd spend you know, far more time looking at the market far more time. Um, but it wasn't until the mid-90s when you know, I realised that um, I was no good at using Elliott Wave and that I had to become more structured. And as I became more structured, um, I became mechanical. And once you become mechanical, um, it's really a prescriptive you know, process to trading because you have very clear rules on you know, when you'll trade and, and when there is a setup, you have very clear rules on you know, where to enter, you know, where to place your stops, you know, where to move your, how to move your stops and, and how to exit. And so when something's really clear like that, when you become a mechanical trader, um, it, it does take less time, you know, because um, you've done all your thinking in developing your methodology. And then when it comes to the actual trading, it's just a, a, it's just, it's just a you know, process of following the dots and, and, and doing as your plan says, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of time. Very interesting. I think that's an aspect that appears to a lot of people to be able to place trades only in the morning and be done after that. For me, it sure was when I read your book the first time. And that's where I learned about the principle of trading based on your data and collecting things that are more objective compared to subjective. But it was also confusing the first time to be looking at these graphs, these equity curves, these, this data. So what would you tell people that want to be starting with being more systematic about the trading? What should they work on or what should they do to be more systematic? I think just embrace a philosophy that you want evidence. You want, you, you, want, you want to gather as much evidence that you can to give you confidence that the pathway that you're following is, is, is going to get you to the destination you want to, you want to get to. So you've you probably heard the expression, there are many, ro many roads that lead to Rome. Okay? So there's more than one way to trade 
And whatever grabs people's interests, I, I just would encourage them to have an evidence-based approach that says, okay, if a particular idea takes your interest, fine, but look for the evidence that if you followed that particular approach, that historically you would have made money. Now, that's a, a very simplistic idea, but if people can just um, adopt, you know, or, 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 you know, say to themselves, oh, I'd like to trade with more confidence or I'd like to trade with more, more evidence about what I'm doing, that, that should give them more confidence. And then once you become an evidence-based trader, and mechanical traders or systematic traders or algorithmic traders, um, it means all the same thing, right? You have a very clear way of how you want to trade, you know. Once you've worked that out is you need to gather the evidence to see whether historically it's would have given you a, a positive expectancy, you know, if you have a, a rising equity curve. And then everything leads from that. There's, you know, there's a lot of traps to be aware of. You don't want to fall into the trap of uh, um, you know, data mining, only, only trading those markets where your strategy looks really, really good on. Um, you don't want to fall into the trap of you know, curve fitting where um, you probably use too many tools with too many flexible variables, which will remove some of the really nasty trades and maybe capture some of the really good trades. You, you, you want to avoid you know, falling into those two traps. Um, but as long as you have a belief that you'd like to trade, if you want more confidence in your trading, the best way to get confidence is to, to gather evidence that what you want to do tomorrow has worked in the past. Knowing full well that even though it may have worked in the past, as we know, there's no guarantees it will continue to work tomorrow. But if your methodology is robust, the odds would suggest that it should probably work okay tomorrow. And then if you embrace diversification, where you will trade multiple, um, you know, diversified and complementary trend and county counter trend strategies over multiple time frames, whether it's short term, medium term and long term, over a portfolio of markets, then you're insuring yourself against any individual you know, market failure or insuring yourself against any individual strategy failure. But everything starts from a desire to become like an evidence based trader. How much evidence would you say is enough evidence? Some people are gonna to try to collect back tests and do like a ton of them and a lot of data. Some people they might they might have, they might not have enough. They had to do like one quick back test and then that's it. Some people are gonna trade demo for like two years before they go live. So how much is enough and how much is maybe too little? Great question. Basically the num the number one attribute trends you wanna trade is a tradable robustness. Okay? We all want a tradable robustness in a methodology. The best evidence for robustness is out of sample performance. The more out of sample performance you have, the more confidence you have. Now, in a, in a perfect world, you want to use all the data you can get. Now, most, most data suppliers, and certainly my data supplier, um, I, have, I have 40 years, 40 years of historical data. A lot of futures, con I trade futures. A lot of futures contracts started, you know, around the 80s. So today there's like, you know, 40 years of historical data. I, I, I work off daddy bars, so that gives me a hell of a lot of data. Now, in the perfect world, the strategy that you and I will trade was first, say, developed by somebody in before 1980. So... If you, if you came across a strategy that was um, developed in, say, 1970, and then you ran it over your historical database that starts at nine, 1980, you will have 40 years of out-of-sample data. That's the perfect place to be, right? Because we know that we've got you know, a wonderful um, catalogue of historical data, which is 40 years old. But over the last 40 years, the world has gone through so many different bull market, bear market, you know, cycles with quite a few financial catastrophes thrown in there. So you know that the last 40 years hasn't been curve fitted to the best conditions, right? You've 
everything in, the, in there from the share market, the 87 crash to the Asian currency crisis, the long-term capital management to the inter- internet um, uh, tech bust in the early 2000s to the um, GFC. It's all in there, right? Last 40 years. So ideally, the strategy that you will be trading was developed before 1980. And so, all the data since then is out of sample. That's, that's picture perfect, right? Unfortunately for most of us, we don't have that luxury because the strategies that we trade probably weren't designed back in 1970. And so you may have a strategy that you designed in 2010. If it's got a positive upward sloping equity curve for the last 10 years, fantastic. Brilliant. You know, 10 years of out of sample data to me would, would be more than, more than enough to give you confidence, right? But it's all a question of how much, how much evidence do you have of robustness in your strategy? If you know your strategy is 10 years old, 20 years old, or 30 years old, I think if, if you have at least 10 years of out of sample you know, performance, that's plenty. That's plenty. Um, you know, if you have a strategy that's got, say, five years of out-of-sample performance, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, so it's a bit of a, you know, you know, it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, the more out-of-sample performance you have or I have, the more confidence we'll have. The less amount of out-of-sample performance, the less confidence you and I can have. So um, in an ideal world, you want to have 40 years of out-of-sample performance over all bull market, bear market conditions, through all financial catastrophes, and you want to see a, a slowly rising equity curve. And if you have that, then you know um, how you won't win all the time, but the, the odds would suggest over the long term, your equity curve will be, be rising. And that's the trade-off that people have to um, work out for themselves. And they may have a really bright idea on how to trade, but if it's only three months old and you only have three months of out-of-sample performance, it won't give you a lot of confidence that, that what you have is robust and, and you won't know whether you may have fallen into that data mining you know, trap or that curve fitting you know, trap. Um, my, my suggestion, the one thing I talk about in the new book, you know, it's all about robustness, is that the best evidence of robustness is out of, out of sample performance. So in the book, I encourage people, you should look at your library or look at um, books which are over, which were published, say, from 2000 or earlier, right? Read these old trading books. And if an, if an idea grabs your attention, then code it up. And if it makes money, you will know because that book was published in 2000 or was published in 1995 or 1999 or 1980, you'll know that that idea or, or, or the performance that you have is all out of sample. Does that make sense? And that will give you confidence. So I'd encourage people to um, don't be seduced by new trading ideas. Um, look for um, ideas which are old and they usually come from books that were say, published 20 years ago, and, um, and, 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 and it's those old ideas that can give you and I the greatest gift that I believe traders can receive, which is proof of out-of-sample performance because we, we know the idea was developed in 1995. We know the idea was developed in 1997 or in 2000, and... and and you can't, you can't dispute that because you've got the book there and the book says published in you know, 1997. Great. If this idea is worthwhile, I'll have 23 years of you know, out-of-sample performance. And that's what I talk about in my new book. All the ideas, or most of the ideas I talk about are old ideas. One issue I had with that though is that Many of the books and strategies that I tried from the past, like maybe 10, 20 years ago, they don't work anymore today. So should you try to make it work or should you just drop it and go to something else, try to find another strategy? Fantastic question. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Go, 
move on to the next idea, move on to the next book. It takes a lot of work to find these old ideas, but there are old ideas that work. But don't get an old idea and think, oh, I like the idea, but if I tweak that variable value, I'll get the equity curve going up. You can't do that because you've got no out-of-sample performance. So as soon as you change a variable, right, it's not an old idea. It's brand new. You know, it's been developed by yourself in 2020 <laughs> and you've got no out-of-sample performance. And so you really, believe me, there are good old ideas. You just have to find them. And, and, and when you do um, code them up, will they have a perfect, a perfect equity curve? No, of course they won't. It will be bumpy. But that's, that's real life. Real life is equity curves make new equity highs and then they go into drawdown. And then they make new equity highs and they go into drawdown. They go new equity highs and they go into drawdowns. So don't be tempted to, to try and tweak a variable to try and smooth out the equity curve because as soon as you do that, it's no longer an old idea. It's a brand new idea. If you code up the idea and, and, and a lot of box are ticked, you know, that you like about it, and the equity curve is, is you know, rising upwards, believe what you see. And if it's good enough, don't play with it. Don't play with it. One topic I think we need to spend a few minutes on is the risk of ruin. That's something that really helped me in my trading in the past, the old calculate your risk of ruin. So can you explain what that is and how should traders look into it? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. In my opinion, the most important thing in trading is risk of ruin. Nothing comes a close second. And when you and I trade, we have no business in putting orders into the market unless we know that individually that the way we trade will produce a risk of ruin of 0%. Risk of ruin refers to the probability that if we continue to trade the way we want to trade, combined with our approach to money management, risk of ruin will tell you and I what the probability is if we continue to trade that way by risking that amount of our risk capital, what will the probability be that you and I will eventually reach our point of ruin, which just means you go bust. You know, I talk about the universal principles, but I've got another thing that I talk about, which is the universal truth, right? Universal truth. Now, despite what many books will say, the universal truth about trading is not about picking tops. It's not about picking bottoms. It's not about having a perfect entry technique. It's not about finding a magic indicator. Um, it's not about being the smartest. And, and, and being profitable in trading is definitely not about knowing any trading secrets. In my opinion, the truth about trading is based on two key factors. Number one, the math. Number two, being the best loser. And number one, the math is simply to be trading with a 0% risk of ruin. That's the math. There's no denying it. And you have to commence trading with a 0% risk of ruin. If the way that you want to trade, combined with how much of your risk capital you, you, you risk, if that produces, generates a mathematical risk of ruin that's 1% or higher, it's too high because you're guaranteed to go bust. Mathematically, you will go bust. Now, somebody who's got a risk of ruin of 30% will naturally go, go broke quicker than someone with only a 1% risk of ruin. But if a person with a low 1% risk of ruin, they will go bust. It's just a matter of time. So we know you can't cheat mathematics. You can't cheat mathematics. And so everyone needs to work out what kind of expectancy will my methodology produce? What number is it? Okay? It, it, the way that we trade has a mathematical expectancy. What is it? And how much of your risk capital do you want to risk per trade? What's your money management strategy? Right? You combine your money management strategy with hopefully a positive expectancy methodology. You combine the two and you will produce a mathematical probability of, of ruining yourself, and it has to be zero. That's the math. That's the universal truth of trading, which is based on two facts, which is, number one, the math, and then number two, 
you've got to be a good loser, right? You've got to be used, you know, be comfortable with losing. Um, I am a world expert at losing. I'm losing all the time. Um, you know, you just have to become comfortable with it. It's just part and parcel of trading. You know, it's the cost of financing the inventory of the business that you and I are in. You know, every business has a cost, you know, working capital, you know, financing cost. That's what trading is. So risk of ruin, in my opinion, is the most important element of, of trading. And if people work lose and everyone loses, or the majority lose, they could quite easily work out what the risk of ruin is, which is looking at how they trade and how much and how they um, allocate their risk capital. And they can quite easily work out what the risk of ruin is. And I tell you, you know, it'll be above 0%. You know, and when they calculate, they go, my God, that's, that's 20%. My risk of ruin is 40%. Oh, my risk of ruin is 50%. I suddenly understand why they've lost. Because people aren't stupid. But unfortunately, people or traders generally are ignorant. And no one talks about risk of ruin, not as much as they should. And, and, and once people are, are educated and understand how important this risk of ruin idea is, hey, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have their hands off the keyboards and go, wow, okay, I can't cheat the math. I need to work this out. And, and, and that would be their first positive step to essentially surviving the markets and once you survive, then you prosper. Some people might think, oh, it's just like a 1.5% risk of ruin, so I can handle that and that's fine. What's the issue with that? What is it that like a 1.5%, which is really low, would be a issue here? What makes it bad? Because mathematically, you'll eventually, your equity curve will eventually go down, right? It'll just hit rock bottom. It may take a lot longer, much longer than somebody with a 30% risk of ruin, but that will eventually um, hit, it just, it's just destined to go to zero. You know, you bust, you, go, you, you just blow out. So let's talk about being a good loser. I think this is a lesson that people should learn as well. So what does it take to become a good loser in trading? Once you understand what risk of ruin is about, and once you realize that the two chief weapons against risk of ruin is a, a positive expectancy strategy and good money management, you suddenly realize that you have to trade very small compared to your risk capital. So suddenly when you start trading correctly, you find the losses aren't a big deal. They're just, they're just irritants, right? Because you're trading really small compared to your uh, risk capital. So first of all, once you understand risk of drawn and how money management is really important at keeping that 0%, you're risking less money. So I think it makes it easier for people to lose if when they are losing, they're losing small. Now, nothing I do is that I'm a pessimist. And so I always expect to lose when I'm trading. So I'll always debit my P&L by my, my stop amount, my risk amount, before I actually place the trade. And so I'm already down money before the markets open up. And what you do is you take the power of what the market can do to your, yourself. You take that power or that the market can, you know, smacks you down because you're losing you take the power away from the market because, you know what, you've already said to yourself, I'm going to lose before I, I trade because, you know, on my P&L today, I'm, I'm, I'm down X percent. That's how much I'm risking today. I expect to lose X percent and that's my account balance. And suddenly you see, that, yeah, you have lost, right? And, and when you do that, you don't mind putting your trade in because the pain, you've already taken the pain, taken the sting away from the market. So two things. One, understand risk of ruin. So you, you reduce your bet size. So you're losing small. And then secondly, before you place your trades with your broker or before you enter them online, debit your P&L spreadsheet with what you expect to lose that day, okay? Embrace the loss. And so it takes all that negative power away away from the, the market and you, you take control. So you welcome your losses. What we're saying is, is another principle that people maybe don't talk about enough or that traders should apply in their trading. What is like something that's really important as well? I'm a big believer in people understanding about this, this concept I call um, maximum adversity, okay? And it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that you need to come to trading being really humble. And even when you have successes, you've got to be, be even more humble because you have to respect the market. 
because the market will do everything it can possibly can to transfer the profits from the weak hands, which are many, to the very few strong hands. And so it's a key concept called you know, uh, the, the market's maximum adversity so that when you come to this business of trading, please don't think the market is like a, a Robin Hood type character who's going to peel money off, off the trees and, and hand it to you, right? No. The market is a big, ugly beast and it gets great satisfaction from taking money out of your account and giving it to, to a minority. So understanding how powerful the market is and what damage it can do to you, it will help you be humble in your approach and I think it will help you embrace this idea of risk of ruin. It will help you embrace this idea of trading small relative to your risk capital. It will help you embrace this idea that every time you trade, you should expect to lose and you should debit your p &L before you place your trades. So very, very key concept that um, will make you humble and it will make you respectful. And I was talking to um, Andre uh, Unger the other day and, um, and we're talking about humility. You know? And Andre is, you know, you know who Andre is. He, he, talks, he talks to people about the importance of knowing who the boss is when you're trading and to realise that you are not the boss, the market is. <laughs> and, and that's so important. You've got to um, remain humble and, 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 and be conscious of how, how much damage the market can do. And if you stay humble, you know, you're going to be trading small. You're going to be always open to learn. You know, you're not going to think you know everything, right? It just puts you in a good, good, a good place. At the same time, when you apply a new strategy in the market, I, I found that things rarely go well the first time. They, they kind of get into a drawdown first or some losses first, and then you got to kind of keep going through that if you're going to be able to, to succeed eventually. Absolutely. Um, Probably the worst, the worst thing that can happen to any trader is if they have instant success. Sounds ironic, doesn't it? it? Sounds like a paradox. But the worst thing that can happen to a trader is to have instant success because they'll think this is so easy. I'll have one win, two wins, three wins, and guess what? On the fourth win, they'll mortgage their house. They'll put on a huge, huge trade, and they'll lose everything. Right? They'll they'll go out backwards. The best thing that can happen to you to traders is that we lose, that we that we learn straight away that it's, it's not easy. That's why it's so important to trade with a zero percent risk of ruin. You, know, you should be able to trade and suffer 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 consecutive losses, you know, and be able to fund fund that and still be trading for when the good wins come along because the good wins do come along. If you don't respect risk of ruin, you've probably gone bust before that good trade comes along. And hence why it's so important to understand risk of ruin, you know? Awesome, Brent. This has been really nice. So what can people find if they will connect with you after this interview? Where can they see your, your, your stuff and maybe even buy your book, which I recommend? Just go to my website. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a fancy website, but they can just go to my website, you know, Google the books. You know, my, my new book will be out, I think, in September. I'm expecting actually the final edit from, from Wiley's tomorrow and they're hoping that the book will be, the hardcover will be out in September. Um, you know, really, if they, if they want to um, understand my, my approach, then I'd recommend, you know, get my Universal Principle book and then combine it with the new book, which is the, uh, the Practical How-To book. And I think, you know, that will give people plenty of ideas to think about you know, and, and if they want to ask me questions, they can they can contact me. You know, through the website, no no, no problems at all. Um, but yeah, like um, you know, I'm really really happy that this um, new book's coming out, and I think it's going to be a very very good book because you know I've seen in the past you know some some traders will write a very good book, and then the following books don't seem to be anywhere near as good as their first book. And I've always, always, you know, been aware of that. Um, and I didn't want to write a book just for the sake of, you know, because why he's asking me to, to write a book, right? Because, I, because you know, I, 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 you know, I cherish, you know, what, what I share with people. And, and I think, I think my universal book out of the two books 
Personally, I think it's more valuable because I think the process is more important than the individual techniques. But I do think this new book is going to be a, a very good book. And I think you can combine the two, you can combine the theory with the practical, and I hope that will give people, you know, a very good idea on how to go forward and, 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 and try and avoid the mistakes that, you know, that I've made over the last 30, 30 odd years. Awesome. So you, your website is indextrader.com.au. We'll leave the link below the video and in the podcast show notes. We'll check it out. And I'll be the first one to buy your book, hopefully. I, I look forward to reading it for sure. It's, it's on Amazon. Um, you can pre-order it, do that, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Awesome. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll hopefully talk soon.